That's awesome, man. <clears throat> All right, so let me, uh, I want to I wanna, uh, go ahead and get your Bibles. You got a Bible? I think, uh, according to my phone, I have a little time left, and I'll try to make good use of that. Um, does this sound sound okay to you guys? It needs a little, like I sound like a girl in this. Can you give me a little, what is that kind of, what do you call that thing, Jordan, where you get a little... Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, a little. <laughs> oh, and we're passing the offering plate. Thank you for that reminder. And we'll have uh, maybe some announcements at the end of the service. Um. All right, so you're you're in now. We're getting better. <clears throat> Thank you. So you're in, we're in, uh, I, I want to look at, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and turn to uh, the book of Luke. Not Luke who's sitting in the back, but Luke. The great physician, Luke, who uh, records uh, a gospel and uh, with a lot of attention to detail. What I want to do, guys, is uh, I want to, I'm going to begin a, a series on the life of Jesus. All right. And um, I tried to, I tried to come up with some real catchy kind of, you know, phrase it, like I, I see, you see the guys online or, or you know, some, they, they, there's really like the really good preachers and they, they have like a, they usually have like a catchy title. I worked all week, kind of gets a catchy title and Joy threw a couple things out, but I, I can't figure out one. So if in the process of this series, if, if you come up with a catchy title, something that doesn't sound too cheesy, uh, that'd be great and, and let me know. But I want to do this series because, um, guys, as the older I get, the 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 more convinced of 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 Jesus, and the more convinced I am of of Him. And I can think of that in theological terms. It's like the more I'm convinced of His uniqueness, the more I'm convinced of, you know, that He is the one and only. I I know that the more I'm convinced that He is the solution and everything else just seems to fall short of that and can get pretty messy. But mainly, like, when I was in Israel um, a couple of months ago, or maybe a month ago, whenever that was, to be honest, like, mainly, the older I get, like, the cooler Jesus gets. And I, I really just wanted to take some time, and, and I know some of the stories that will hit. I, I'm going to do kind of the life of Jesus in a chronological format. And I know some of the stories we hit are stories that you've heard before, but that's okay. There are stories I've heard before too. Um, but I just, I just really feel like kind of heavy and led to to do this, this this kind of chronological walk through the life of Jesus. And it'll probably take a little while to do, but um, uh, we won't try to do it all in, in one week. But I, I, uh, I, that's 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 where we're headed. It reminds me of when my my kids, when you, when they were 13, 14, 15 years old. How many of you guys had kids that were 13, 14, 15 years old? How many of you guys, when you had kids that were 13, they thought you were really cool? <laughs> One, Lynn, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'll tell you, Lynn, my kids did not think I was cool. I, and I, this, this shocked me because uh, all their friends thought I was cool. And I couldn't understand why if the friends were, I'm cool. Do you think your parents are cool? Yes. <laughs> I feel like she kind of got put on the spot right there. I don't know. Uh, all, all my all my friends, they they, they 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 all the kids' friends thought I was cool, but my kids didn't think I was cool. But now, uh, as I'm getting older, they get a little cooler. I, I'm getting a little cooler. Have you noticed that? As they get older, I get cooler. And um, you know, I why is that? Maybe, uh, maybe, because uh, I hadn't changed really, and other than to get older and fatter, which is less cool, but somehow I've become more cool, and I don't know, maybe that's maturity, and I think, guys, as we get older, um, given all that we see, like, and we begin to mature in our understanding of, like, the futility of the world, not only that, we begin to mature in our understanding of the futility of kind of religious and church systems. Like when I when I see all that, then the cooler Jesus gets, mm-hmm. and 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 so we're going to take some time then and and concentrate on um, the life of Jesus.
silence can be a little awkward, can it? <laughs> don't, don't blow my illustration here. Uh, silence can be a little awkward, a little scary. You can reach wrong conclusions. It can produce a little, uh, a little anxiety. You know, the tension of that quiet, the tension of the silence can produce a little anxiety in us. For Israel, there had been 600 years of silence. Right? So here's this nation that was set up as a theocracy. Now, think if you're set up and established as a theocracy, that means that, um, and, I, and I realize they had kings, but the original design was this theocracy and these were God's chosen people. And from the time of the last prophet, who was uh, Malachi, they, they are, yeah, Malachi, they, they had experienced 600 years of silence. No, I think about what that means. Like, so historically, so no, no words from the Lord at all. Like we come in on a Sunday, and if we don't hear the Lord speak today, we're like, something's wrong. These guys had experienced 600 years of silence. No words from the Lord, no prophets, uh, no, uh, no instructions from the Lord, no encouragement. And, um, and understand that against their backdrop, this was a problem because they understood that when God moves, he tells his people, right? That was Amos. Surely the Lord, uh, sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. They had this in their backdrop of understanding, and they knew that when the Lord moves, he speaks, and he tells his prophets what he's doing and what he's accomplishing, and they're watching, and for 600 years, there's silence. In the middle of this 600 years, they find themselves um, occupied and oppressed by an oppressive system uh, called the Roman system, and, and in the middle of that, they're like, man, 600 years, we haven't heard a word. Um, that 600 years, of course, is known as the silent years, but um, he, he, is, he, is about, he is about to move. And, and the prophet that speaks up and begins to, to break that silence, of course, is the prophet John the Baptist, right? Uh, John the Baptist was foretold about in Isaiah 40, uh, verse 3. You don't need to turn there. Let me read that to you. But this is really cool. Like it says, a voice is calling. Isaiah prophesying uh, what this voice will do. And this voice calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Now that doesn't mean a whole lot to me, actually, to just sit and read that. It's like, wh what does that mean? Clear the way from, for the Lord in the wilderness. I, I don't really resonate. I don't, I don't quite uh, uh, grasp that. So I want to put that into uh, a little bit of a context historically. There was an Eastern proverb that said, there are three states of misery. One is sickness. How many of you guys had the flu lately? I have, but it, it was, and I was in India, and it is miserable, right? So these, this, the old story here, the old Eastern proverb is, there's three states of misery. One is sickness. One is fasting. How many of you guys are fasting currently? All right, well... <clears throat> Maybe that's something we want to revisit, but well, for now, <laughs> can I tell you that uh, I'm not uh, fasting, but but Joy's got me on a cleanse. <laughs> I came home from India, and and um, I don't like Indian food particularly. And I came home, and I thought this is great to be back in America, and I'm kind of shoveling it in and having a good time. And Miss Joy told me it was time for a cleanse. Yeah, it's terrible. I wake up in the morning. She gives me like a little lemon juice. And then uh, she puts this uh, spinach in there, some kind of plant-based uh, protein. Yeah, it's not funny. It's, uh, I mean, I appreciate but it's, it's. And then she, and she grinds that stuff up. And I'm supposed to drink that. And then she's like, oh, but you can have oatmeal. Well, that's nice, but it's about a half a cup of oatmeal, and, and it's uh, no sugar, of course. And no, so she's got me on this cleanse. It's a fast of sorts, and I've let, 
roll through my mind several theories as to why she's doing this. <clears throat> maybe I thought first maybe she was angry with me. I thought maybe uh, at one point, I thought maybe, uh, you know, honestly, like maybe she's trying to take me out of here. <laughs> but then I realized like the insurance money is really not that significant and, and that couldn't be it. So I don't know why she's doing it. I'm just telling you guys I'm on this cleanse. It's sort of like a fast in the sense that I, I, I don't not eating any meat. I'm not eating any sugar. I'm not eating any dairy. dairy. No gluten, no salt, no fun. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the Eastern proverb was there are three states of misery, sickness, fasting, amen, amen. And the third was travel. All right, so I'm putting this in the context, remember, of this prophet who's like, there's this voice that's going to come, and this voice is going to say, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness and make smooth a desert, uh, in the desert a highway for our God. So this Eastern proverb is like there's three states of misery, one is sickness, and one is fasting, and one is travel. Well, travel for us is pretty easy, right? We, we uh, get in the car and we drive somewhere. It wasn't easy for you guys in South Sudan, but we get in the car and we drive somewhere, or we, uh, we get on a, uh, you know, we get on an airplane, we go somewhere, and we stay at the hotel. That's all good. Uh, it, travel for us is, is easy. It's, it's enjoyable for many, but this was not the case 2,000 years ago. Kind of like what you were seeing in South Sudan. I've always been, I've always been amazed at, like, the travel. I remember once being in a, we had actually gotten detained. Um, and, you know, that's a polite word for arrested. And they had us in a little compound there. And I'd been kind of smart like with the guy because when he was arresting us, he, 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 I, I told him, hey, bro, I've been in worse jails than this in Myrtle Beach before. <laughs> he didn't seem to understand. But anyway, I was there and, and, and we're, we're kind of, we're kind of in this thing. And there was a guy who came to see us. There was a guy who walked 60 miles. You guys walked six? He walked 60, well, I guess 12 round trip. And you had a motorcycle. Carter walked six and six. So this guy walked 60 miles. It took him three days. He walked 60 miles. He came to see us. And he said, hey, um, and they wouldn't let him talk to us because we were being detained, right? And then they said, hey, um, he said, hey, uh, you know, he finally got, and they came to me and said, okay, you have 10 minutes with him. This guy walked 60 miles, three days. I don't know what he's eating out there, you know, in that kind of terrain. I don't know where he's getting water. And he, he walked 60 miles, and he was happy to get 10 minutes with us. His only request was, hey, next time you come, why don't you land in my village, and we can do like a pastor's conference there, and nobody will arrest you. <laughs> I'm like, well, bro, it sounds like a good plan. Uh, and if we can get out of here, maybe that, <laughs> maybe, I can't come right now. And so people in, in, in developing countries, or certainly back uh, 2,000 years ago, they would travel. And when they traveled, this was hard and this was, this was, uh, this was difficult. So uh, in those days, there were, part of what makes that difficult is in those days, there were just a few roads that had surface to them. There were some roads that had surface, but, and, and believe me, I'm going somewhere with this, there's some roads that had surface. Uh, but it was different. Uh, Solomon, you remember Solomon laid a road? He laid a road of black basalt, we're told. It was like this black rock. And he laid this road that led to Jerusalem. And this was to make things uh, easier for the pilgrims who went to Jerusalem. Solomon uh, probably laid that road also to kind of show off his riches and how big and how important his government was. And so he had that. And, 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 and in all cases, in, in this period of time, or at least by and large, roads that existed were roads that were built for the king and they were built for use by the king. Yeah. Okay, you're starting to get this? They were roads that were built for the king, and they were roads that were built for the use of the king, and generally they were called the king's highway. And these roads were kept in repair only in as much as the king needed them to be in repair for when he traveled, right? And so if the king were going to visit some place in his uh, king kingship or kingdom or whatever what a kingdom if he's going to visit some place in his kingdom uh in a, in a particular area a message would be sent out to the people and the people were uh, as a their job and their responsibility was to get the king's roads ready in order for the king's journey so now when isaiah 
says this in, in, in his prophecy. And then as John the Baptist repeats it here in, in uh, chapter 3 of Luke in his prophecy, we can understand in this context that what's, uh, what's been said is, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make a smooth Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. The prophecy here is that John would be preparing the way for a king. Um, look in Luke. We're going to read here. Luke chapter 3. Uh, uh, and this same uh, uh, passage, of course, is, is in the other Gospels. But we're going to look at Luke. Luke has a little bit more detail here. So Luke chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Now, in... Uh, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, okay, we got that, or was Tiberius Caesar, 15 years, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, all right, they would historically know than that is, and Herod, when I was in Israel, we saw Herod's palaces, they were amazing. Herod was the, I don't even know how to pronounce that word, Tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was the Tetrarch of the region, blah, 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 and Lysa with blah, blah, blah. Here's my point is Luke lays out John the Baptist story here and he, he lays out six different, play, different ways historically where it can be dated. Why would he do that? He's this physician who records this gospel and when you're reading the gospels you can see that Luke includes in his gospel a lot more uh, detail. And so this writer of the gospel includes six places, uh, six time references to when John the Baptist emerges and, his, and the ministry begins. It was because Luke understood as he's writing his gospel that with, and uses these six historical references, he understands that this is the, the, the pinnacle of history. He's trying to help us and help those who were there at, his, at that time. Help us understand, like, all, listen guys, when John the Baptist comes to prepare this, this road and to prepare the way for this king who would come, this is a pinnacle point in history at which point all history changes and things are never, ever the same again. This is why, this is why, honestly, like I can be in the East and, uh, uh, and, and they'll tell me about the exploits of their gods or I can be in uh, northwest India and they'll tell me about the exploits of Buddha. Or I can be in the Middle East and, and they'll tell me all about Allah. Like, guys, this is why, like, like, the pinpoint, the pinnacle of history has nothing to do with Buddha. It has nothing to do with Kant and his humanism. It has nothing to do with uh, Muhammad. The pinnacle of history is around the onset of this coming King Jesus. Are we getting that? And I will promise you that in your life, um, uh, that's why, like I can say with such assured confidence that, that Jesus is, I don't know what you're looking at today, but I will promise you he is the answer to that. And I will also promise you that anything short of him will fall short. And it's likely to create more of a mess than you're in already. Is this making sense? And so here is Luke, and he says in chapter 3, he's beginning to introduce John the Baptist, who, of course, is going to introduce Jesus. And let's just kind of continue to read there in chapter 3. And he, John the Baptist, uh, uh, how many of you guys know that John the Baptist was not really Baptist? <laughs> is everybody kind of aware of that? The Greek there is John the Baptizer. But anyway, I think... Uh, some Southern Baptist commentaries see it differently, but <clears throat> he comes, he comes in this district around the Jordan. Uh, he is preaching in verse three, he's preaching a baptism of repentance and of forgiveness of sins. And, and, and Luke references, of course, the, 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 the prophecy that we just mentioned, uh, as it is written in the book of the words, Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready uh, the way of the Lord, make his path straight. We're preparing a road. John's like, my role is to prepare a road for the king. It says, every ravine will be filled, every mountain and hill will be brought low, the crooked uh, will become straight, and the rough road smooth, and all flesh, all flesh will see the salvation of God. He's defining, even in this prophetic utterance, what the nature is of this king and the nature of this kingdom that he brings. Um, he's like, all flesh will see 
the salvation of God. Now, I can imagine that that was sounding pretty good to a group of Jewish people who hadn't heard the Lord uh, speak in 600 years and who were held in captivity and under bondage of this oppressive Roman government. What they missed was um, this kingdom he's talking about is a kingdom of salvation. It's not a political one. And so he began saying to the crowds, who were going uh, out to be baptized to him. How's this for church growth? John is kind of fostering a following who is coming out into the wilderness to receive this baptism of repentance and forgiveness. This following, and he's telling them about uh, this coming uh, king. He's telling them, like, we're going to make the path straight. We're going to we're preparing for the coming of this new king who's going to institute a new kingdom. He's building, he's building a group of people. And so he says to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee? <laughs> I'm not sure that's a good church growth strategy. He says, uh, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Uh, instead, like, therefore, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. Uh, for I say to you uh, that from these stones, God is able to raise up the children to Abraham. <clears throat> He's like, look, guys, like practice what you preach. This is not about some mental ascent. Hey, hey, check this. This is not about some mental ascent you're making. This is about repentance. Repentance would imply that I believe something. To, we were talking about this in our Thursday group. Repentance would imply that I believe something to the extent that I uh, submit myself to it. And if I'm submitting myself to it, that repentance will bear fruit. I was in China. This is off script. I was in China with a guy, and he told me we were kind of turning around, and, and we were, you know, I was going to try to get him. We were trying to get to Red Square, and, and but we were on to a place up north to, to, to preach and teach. And we kind of get to know the, the, the guy who was helping us get through Beijing and, and warning us about different things in Beijing. And, and so as we're talking, he said, and by the way, I want you to pray because uh, I got a friend who is, is going to court uh, two days from now. And he said, I said, well, uh, yeah, like, yeah, of course. Like, what, what, do you, what do you want us to pray? He said, well, I, actually, I'm not too worried because they're accusing him of being a Christian, but I don't think they have enough evidence to convict. And I said, you know what? I got a lot of friends at home who are accused of being Christians, but I don't know whether we can find enough evidence to convict. Uh, yeah, so I'll pray for your guy. That's what John's talking about here. He's talking about a repentance where uh, that will bear fruit in keeping with the confession. Your confession is, we have Abraham our father, for I say to you that these stones of God is able to... That's, he's like, that's nothing. God can raise up, God can raise up children to Abraham. And he said, indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. So that every tree, check it out, every tree that does not bear good fruit, what's good fruit? Oh, good fruit was where we saw here back in chapter, in verse 8. This good fruit is this fruit of, of repentance that's in keeping with our confession. And, and he says, indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the tree, so that every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds were gathering, they're saying, well, what, what shall we do then? And he would answer me and say, oh, What's that fruit look like? Oh, how about this? How about, um, some would argue this is a social gospel. And let me tell you what, to a certain extent they're right. Because he says, oh, what would this fruit look like? He said, well, he would answer and say to them, well, this fruit looks like the man who has two tunics it, uh, shares with the guy who has no tunics. This is in verse 11. And he who has no food, uh, he does likewise. He shares. Mm, I don't hear that one too much. And some tax collectors also came to be baptized. And they say, teacher, what do we do? And he says to them, well, collect no more than what you've been ordered to do. Stop ripping people off. Can I tell you, like, I came across a scenario today. Like, can we just comment on the greed of corporate America? He says, stop ripping people off. Oh, you want to tell me, like, this is, Dave, don't get liberal. This is not a social gospel. I understand that, but I understand also that Jesus' proclamation and John's proclamation here was, was that, that we would bear, we would have, um, 
we would bear fruit that's in keeping with the confession that we've offered. And when he's asked, like, well, what's that look like? He's like, oh, that's like share your stuff, man. Share your stuff. And by the way, um, if you're working for the government, the, for the tax collectors, like, don't rip people off. Just, just take what you're supposed to take. Some shoulders were questioning him, saying, and what do we do? Well, he said, how about this? Don't take money from anybody by force or accuse people falsely and, and be content with your wages. Now, while the people were in a state of expectation and all wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he was there, they started thinking, this guy is Jesus. John answered and says, oh, now for me, I, I baptize you the water, but there's one who's coming that's mightier than I am, and I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork in his hand uh, and to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather wheat into his barn, he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So, talking about John Steer, still here, with many other exhortations. My battery, you're right, battery's dead. Okay, so verse 19. So when Herod the Tetrarch was reprimanded to him because of Herodias, uh, his brother's wife, and because of all wicked things that Herod had done, Herod uh, was also added to them, and he locked John up in prison. Well, there's John. What I want to do is I want to apply, I want to look at this just for a minute. I don't think I have too much longer, but I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to miss this because I, I want to I look at this. Um, I, I want to tell you, I have heard a lot of teaching on prophetic ministry, but I have never heard principles that have been extrapolated from John. And um, John was this, like, great prophet. Obviously, he's the first one to speak after these 600 years of silence, uh, but but I haven't heard it taught, really. And I, I don't know what that is. Maybe it doesn't sell quite as well on the circuit or but I, I, I think there's something in here for us. There's some value here for us. Because, guys, let me tell you, like, when we're talking about prophetic ministry, all, all we're really talking about, like, don't, don't get all humble, hoobie-jooby by that. It's like all we're really talking about is hearing from God and speaking it to those around us. How many of you would say, you know what, <clears throat> I'm just not called to hear from God? <laughs> right. How many of you would, call, would say, well, uh, I'm, I'm called to hear from God, but... I'm just not called to speak that. That'd be kind of crazy, right? And I, now, I will, there's some things he'll speak to me that I don't say. But on the other hand, there's a whole lot he's speaking to us that we say. So don't don't get all whacked out about this prophetic ministry. Um, what we're talking about here is is our role, our ministry in in the world around us. And I think there's some principles here that we're going to see in John, or that we just read, that we see in John, that really speak to our role in culture. Okay? You with me? Go like this. Mm-hmm. Tell me, say, I'm not asleep. Okay. Well, I saw one or two drifting up. That's all right. How about this one? The first principle is uh, John fearlessly denounced evil wherever he found it. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Is that true? Yeah, look at verse 7 and 9. So he began saying to the crowds who were going to be baptized. Man, who were these people? These were the church folks of the day. He's like, you, and this was the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he, he, the church leaders. And he, he spoke to these crowds who were going to be baptized, and he said, you brood of vipers, you weren't, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Like um, John, is talk, uh, John is talking to the church folks of the day, he's talking to these people who are caught in kind of meaningless tradition. He's caught, he's talking to people who, who concentrate on and who in appearance may look very good, but inside they're rotting. Uh, this prophetic edge to John's ministry, this prophetic ministry we're called to, 
guys, um, there's no way to avoid that we are at times called to speak to the evil wherever we find it. And sometimes we'll find it like right in our own ranks. We're just people, right? Well, he didn't hesitate either to speak to the evil that he saw outside. This is interesting to me because, like, check it out. Like, how many of you have heard this this phrase? Like, oh, well, you know, <clears throat> we're not called to judge those outside the body. Have you heard that? Well, good, because that's a biblical phrase. But the application of that is, look, we we are not called to pass judgment on people but we are called to call out evil. Um, and that's what John does here. Like, look at verse 18 and 19. So with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. Look at 19. But when Herod, Herod was the, he was the king, right? He was this, this guy, the, the kind of the, 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 the representative governor of the day. Herod was reprimanded to him, uh, reprimanded by him because of Herodias. Herodias was this temple priestess. Okay, she was like a cultist, right? And what Herod did was he arranged for this marriage between, first of all, he killed two of his sons, and then he arranges for this marriage between Herodias and his uh, other son, Herod the Second. And he arranged for this marriage because he knew, or he thought, that her cultic power would give him the power he needed as he began to rule. Uh, the only problem was is that Herod the second was actually her uncle. Would you, you, how many of you guys would marry your uncle? How many of you guys would marry your aunt? I'm still not getting any takers here. And so what Herod was doing, obviously, was he, 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 he's, he's arranging this marriage that's out of bounds with what God uh, prescribes and what he called for. It's out of bounds with what's normal. And, and, and he's, he's arranging this marriage so that he can tap into and rely on this cultic power. And John calls him out and he's like, that's not right. But because he calls him out for not only that, but at the end of 19, all the wicked things Herod had done because he calls him out on that. Herod uh, puts John in prison. Now, here's the deal, guys. Like, part of our ministry, there's no way around it. We're extrapolating from John. There's no way around it. As we engage in ministry with the world, part of that is, is that we are called to, I'm telling you, we are called to fearlessly denounce evil wherever we find it. And the problem is um, um, that when we do that, often there's a price to pay. Uh, and guys, I'm not just talking about moral issues. Like we can all kind of rally around that, feel good about ourselves. But I'm not just talking about that. What what about corporate greed? What about employers who rip off their employees? What about employees who are slack and take advantage of kind employers? He he's like, look, um, we're supposed to call that stuff out on both sides. And um, we have to recognize, and I, and I hope that we would be positioned where we'd be in a place to be willing to pay uh, the price for that. It's probably not likely that uh, <clears throat> that any of us are going to jail for calling out governmental evils, at least right now. Some would argue that if Trump continues to get his way, it could come become more likely. Or some would argue on the other side of that that if they got their way, it would become likely. That's probably not the case. But there's still a price to pay out there in, in the, the culture of, of public opinion. Is that correct? Secondly, the thing that John does here, and the principle I think that we can extrapolate is he urgently summoned men to righteousness. It wasn't just a, a condemnation of something negative, but he, he also caused them into something. I have been, I'll tell you with, uh, with great regret, like I have been in a couple of situations that are really fresh in my mind, even though they occurred years ago, where I was calling someone out over an evil practice. And I left one of those meetings one time and was approached by uh, a, a lady 
who was far more spiritual and far more discerning than me. And as she approached me, she was like, that was really good. And I'm like, well, <laughs> thank you very much. I stood up for what was right. And she's like, yeah, but you offered no solution. Prophetic ministry is not only um, calling uh, out evil wherever that occurs, but it's also summonsing men and sisters into, into righteousness. John's message was not just a mere uh, negative calling out. Look, I know that evangelism is no longer in vogue. Is that true? Evangelism is old-fashioned. But guys, I want to tell you, if we are not calling people into the righteousness of Jesus, to new life in him, then we are not carrying out all he has for us. I'm not interested in going to Darfur and hanging out with the Resigat in the cattle camp just so I can eat the goat they have. Nor am I interested in hanging out with a lost buddy here in Roanoke uh, without telling him about the other side of the equation, which is like Jesus offers you a way out. And Jesus offers you his righteousness because you can't be righteous in and of yourself. And he made this way possible for you to have his kingdom is about peace and joy. And you're all caught up, man. You're all tied up and you're bonded. But like he makes this possible for you to have peace and joy. You must submit your life to him. John's ministry shows us that, that, that that's part of our call. How about this third one? Um, John, uh, John came, he, he, we know that uh, John came from God. It, it was prophesied. We also know that he came out of the desert, right? Remember, it says he was like uh, wearing uh, like these funky clothes, man. He, he looked like, I always think he looked like Jake. He's kind of got this like bushy hair and, and, and he, he's eating locusts and honey. Maybe his wife was making him cleanse. I don't know. And he's, <laughs> he's this guy that comes from God, but he's like coming out of the desert. But that's not all. Like this is a guy who has, um, we can see this principle in his ministry. He has undergone years of lonely preparation by God. I remember a story of a guy who uh, told me that uh, a young guy in his church and, and a guy came and he said, look, I, um, I feel like God's uh, called me uh, prophetically. And the pastor was like, yeah, uh, I, I actually, I can see that. And it, and it was, it was very evident that this guy had amazing prophetic gifts. And he's like, yeah, I, I can see it. And he's like, so what do you want me to do? And he said, how about uh, scrubbing those toilets for a while? Because there's some things that God wants to teach you in that, that uh, when you are up front and, and administering this gift of prophecy, you, you're prepared to do that. Not many of us will be uh, called to spend years in the wilderness to prepare. Sometimes I'm thinking, Lord, I wish you'd go ahead and call me the wilderness for about two or three years. I think I could use the break. But not many of us are going to be called into the wilderness to prepare like John was, but I'm telling you, if you are not spending some time in preparation as you meet your God every morning or every day, um, if you're not spending some time in preparation with him, your, your ministry is worthless. Like maybe some of you think you got a word for me. I mean, if you've spent some time with the Lord on that word, and, like, you've prayed about that, like, please share it with me. I might need to hear it. Maybe some of you think you got a word from me and you haven't spent some time with the Lord on that. Like, don't tell me. I'm not interested. John's ministry uh, brings that out. Fourth, and this is the final one, and I think maybe the most of, uh, important one, can we see as we read through here in Luke chapter 3, that John's ministry, this prophetic ministry, the same ministry that we're called to, <clears throat> yes, it uh, called out sin as he saw it, wherever he saw it. Yes, he offered uh, the other side of the solution to that and, and preached uh, coming into righteousness. And yes, he had had this preparation from God. The other thing is uh, John in his ministry, what we see here is his main thing was 
He, he was pointing beyond himself. It, it was not himself that he wanted people to see. He was in an effort here to prepare them for the one who would come. Hey, guys, I don't know what you're checking out on the Internet, but I will tell you this. Be leery of the prophet who wants center stage. Very dangerous. Sometimes God will put a man center stage, and hopefully when he does, that man has spent some time in preparation with him, and so he can handle that. Uh, But sometimes people um, are able, particularly in a media-driven era like we live, sometimes people are just kind of able to create their own stage. And when you encounter ministry or a prophetic, whether it's prophetic ministry or any ministry, when you encounter that ministry from one who really seems to relish the floodlights, be very careful. Guys, the ministry uh, we're called for is not, is not um, a ministry of our own edification. It's true, obviously, that as we minister... As we uh, engage what God puts in front of us, it's true that we grow in that process. We're edified in that process. And oftentimes, uh, more than not, there's, there's a lot of joy in that process. But that's not, the, that's not the point of it. The point of what we do, whether it's um, in church on a Sunday when Fistan tells us, uh, go and pray with someone or whether it's as we engage those outside, or whether it's when we go to Darfur, the point of what we do always, always, always is to point uh, those with whom we are engaging to the reality and the love of Jesus, period. Because he's their answer. I want to just pray for us, and we'll have a a time of communion. Um. And with this launch, we'll begin to get a little bit more into the life of Jesus. And we're going to do that through his ministry in in kind of chronological fashion. Uh, And we'll do, uh, hopefully, what John is suggesting here uh, as we point ourselves to him, understanding that he's uh, the solution. And, guys, I want to to share something with you. Can we do this? Like, I'm going to pray for us. And I guess uh, Evan and these guys are going to play a little bit. And that's cool. Hey, guys, um, the New Testament is, is, is pretty interesting in Corinthians, the passages around uh, communion. And w- one thing, I, let, me, let me say it this way. Like, communion is a time for us to gather. Uh, the New Testament says we, in remembrance, Jesus is like, in remembrance, do this with me. Do, uh, do this uh, in remembrance of me. That word remembrance is like, oh, just as if you were there. So we're kind of a hang loose, casual bunch, and that's cool. But like, uh, if you want to hang loose and gather and talk as we do communion, like go go outside and do that because we're gonna we're gonna gather around this table, and we're gathering around in remembrance of um, this one that John uh, pointed to, this one that um, John is saying is the King, this one who comes in order to uh, establish a kingdom, a whole different type of a kingdom here on earth, one that we have now, Jesus said, within our reach, within our grasp. And all of that is made possible uh, by way of his blood that was shed and his body that was broken, that when we apply it, gives us entrance into his kingdom. And so uh, let's kind of maintain that that thought and, and even a sense of reverence and it's cool, like, if you want to, like, go talk to your buddy, that's cool. Like, go, out, go outside and do that. Um, but let's kind of maintain that as we really uh, look to the Lord and, and remember uh, his sacrifice for us.